Open, ladies and gentlemen. It's that's my stuff. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We've had a hubbub of conversation over lunch, and I'd like to remind you that there's plenty of time to talk after the meeting. Although the meeting officially closes at quarter to four, tea and coffee will be served at quarter to four, and there's no urgency for uh, those who wish to stay and talk about the topics of this meeting with the speakers and with others from the audience. After that, we're not chasing everyone away at four o'clock. You can stay till quite a bit later than that if you wish. This morning, we heard a lot about what's under the ground at the present time and about the production methods for shale gas. And this afternoon, we're going to address the key issues as, uh, concerning whether or not shale gas can be extracted safely. And Peter Stiles talking about induced seismicity, which we touched upon this morning. Peter had a preview this morning, or gave a, a quick overture to the talk this morning. And then we move on to Rob Ward from the British Geological Survey, who will talk about groundwater issues. And then closing the afternoon's presentations with Tony Grayling, who will place it all into the regulatory framework. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Peter Stiles, uh, who will give his talk on I hope you're nicely mellowed with a, a decent geological lunch and don't throw anything sharp. Okay, um, this is me. Uh, those of you who get my age, you'll know it's very difficult to impress your children, particularly my daughter. So when I was looking for some slides, I found this one of me being interviewed outside the Houses of Parliament. It's the only time I ever will be, so I thought I'd put it up. Okay, the geology of the UK nicked from the BGS website. Okay, we've been talking about rocks which lie here about 300 and odd million years ago at the base of the Carboniferous. Okay, and we've been talking about them here. But in actual fact, anywhere where you have younger rocks like this, the chances are that you have that Carboniferous and also the Boland Shales or something like it beneath them. So in actual fact, coming down through Cheshire where I live, the Boland Shales are no doubt there at about four and a half kilometres. On the fringes of Keel where I'm at um, where I'm a professor, there are rocks as you just go towards the pen ends of the bone shield. So they're actually very widely spread, which is why I suspect ge geographically so are you. It's not just Lancashire. And of course there are several basins, so I'll walk a little bit further, so. and there are various structures, but we're here, the base of what we used to call an old money. The shale is the bottom. Other hydrocarbon basins, the Cheshire out here, the Weald and offshore. Also, major structures which run through the UK. Okay, carbon, after the Carboniferous, uh, the southwest. These are older structures running up the edge. Older structures here, which all contribute to issues to be. I must have nick from my colleagues. Tom Sima slides there, though, David. Most of it nicked from my colleagues in BGS, Brian Babti. And we have two different pictures. These are larger earthquakes of magnitude green. There aren't that very many of them, considering how many faults and lineaments you can actually because most faults aren't seismically active. Okay. We look at lower magnitude earthquakes here. You see there's a lot more of them. And the ones in red are coal mining induced earthquakes. I'm going to talk a bit about them. Because we haven't had a long time to look at shale gas. But we've had 30 years, or at least I have had, to look at fracturing caused in exactly the same part of the geological <coughs> column. This is what's called a Gutenberg-Richter plot. And it plots the logarithm of the number of earthquakes against their size. And it forms a straightish line. And more or less where it intersects down here tells you something about the largest earthquake you're ever likely to get in an area. It's not quite so simple. But in the UK, we haven't had anything much above just about six. And depends which line you take. But that's probably about the maximum. There's a reason for that. It's to do with the strength of rock. OK? This is an elastic band. A small one, They're actually stronger than I thought. Okay. Ah! 
you can only get a certain amount of energy out of the elastic band because of its strength. If you want a bigger bang, and I'm not even going to try to snap this, you've got to have stronger material. So the size of earthquake, even the little ones hurt, <laughs> the size of earthquake is not just to do with the stress you're applying, it's to do with the intrinsic strength of the material you're applying it to. And you cannot make a bigger bang than the material is capable of storing. That's actually a very important point, I think, anyway. Now, how did I get into this? By accident, because my PhD is on plate tectonics, but I went to be a lecturer in Swansea University at the edge of the South Wales coalfield. And I hadn't been there long when they came down to talk to me about catastrophic failures in mines associated with catastrophic emissions of gas, unconventional gas in some senses, and that as they mined, they got millions of cubic feet of methane issued catastrophically into their workings. And when you mine, actually, you take away a slice of the coal, a few metres thick, and you let it collapse behind. That's what long wall mining is. And so the rocks collapse after it. You get a zone where you get it full of crushed rock. As you go up, you start to stress the surface of diff the rock in different ways. You get fractures forming. You get bedding plane separations. Eventually, hopefully, you get elastic surface subsidence, which are not too troublesome, according to the code. And I was told, well, they're having these catastrophic failures and, and they heard rock noises, which are minor earthquakes. So I said, well, why don't we try and monitor these? And you can't actually put things underground in mines because of the explosive atmosphere. I said, we'll do it from the surface. And I was advised by someone very senior in BGS at the time that I'd never do it, actually. But I was only 27 then, so I didn't take any notice of him. I rarely take <laughs> notice of people now, you might notice as well, actually. But we put seismometers on the surface a kilometre or so above these, and we started to pick up small earthquakes, clear P waves, nest waves. And I've done this all around the world now for more than 30 years. Looked at mining and the fact that when you generate a stress underground, you generate fractures. If you don't have a fracture, you don't get an earthquake, OK? Right? An earth, yes, that's absolutely true. That's still, that's still fracture moving. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> OK? So we did that in South Wales. I cut a long story short, but we actually devised a method for predicting these catastrophic failures by using the number of tensile failure events. I'm not sure events, so I do know a lot about tensile failure events, actually. And I then moved to Liverpool, where I thought this was all come to an end. But it turned out we started to have earthquakes beneath Sherwood Forest. Sorry. Now, Sherwood Forest, contrary to most uh, cooler areas, had a Conservative MP. Right? And down the golf club, he said to the... Uh, the he said to the uh, director of the, of the, of the Nottingham Coal Field, John, why are we getting earthquakes? Is it you? And John Oakton said, not us, not us. British Coal always denied any responsibility for earthquakes. But we'll get somebody in. There's a guy at Liverpool. <laughs> so we put a network of seismometers over a big area here. These are 10 kilometres square. So this is about 30 by 20 in total of North Nottinghamshire. And of course, we started to see earthquakes. Right? These are all individual seismic events happening and, of course, clustering actually over workings. The strange thing here was, in actual fact, this is the surface. This is the Sherwood sandstone. We actually had earthquakes. These three here fell on this fracture here. So mining at depth can create stresses which produce earthquakes much higher. Not, not a great deal higher, but enough higher. In actual fact, in this case, we actually had extraction at 700 metres. We had events all the way up there. None in this through the Permian limestone, magnesium limestone. But once we get to this strong rock, we actually have fractures happening here. So we've got a bit of a reputation for being able to monitor induced seismicity. Now, I might be wrong, but I think my, the Welsh work was certainly the first induced seismicity monitored in the UK, because I'm quite old. So, we started then going down boreholes because um, it is easier to monitor if you're actually down at the level of the coal. So, we're actually down several hundred metres, 700 metres, in fact, in the coal seam that's being worked. And you can actually get really very good pictures of what's going on 
as extraction takes place, and in actual fact, they look rather similar to the pictures that uh, reach down. This is looking along the edge. This is looking along it. As you deform it by taking out So, we learnt a great deal about, my, about mining seismicity and also about the strength of coal measures rocks. Now, I've compiled statistics on thousands of them. I've actually m monitored tens of thousands of earthquakes from mining in Scotland, in Nottinghamshire, in South Wales, around Staffordshire. <laughs> the maximum earthquake we have ever detected in, well, it, it's about the same in each of those areas. It's about magnitude 3. Magnitude 3.2 in Scotland. And that is because it's that strength of a rubber band. Okay. So he tells us the maximum energy you can put into coal measures, carboniferous rocks, and not, not all measures, coal measures and its surroundings, layered sedimentary rocks in the UK, probably don't have much more strength than that. If you want to get bigger earthquakes, you've got to go down into basement or granite, okay? And then you can get bigger earthquakes. I'm running out of elastic bands, so I won't snap any more. And so to frack. Okay, the guys have already shown you pictures like this. Okay, but in terms of completion of the well, you've got several layers of containment. You've got surface casing, which goes down to beneath the aquifers. And this is probably quite realistic. The aquifers are up here. The surface casing is here, intermediate casing, and then production casing. So in some places, you've actually got three layers of casing between you and the surrounding rock. That is then cemented. It's really important to know how well that's done as well. Okay? There are things called cement, bond logs, logs, and all sorts of things. But the business end of the fracking is down here, okay, where you're putting fluid in. And I won't talk about the fluids because Bob is going to, but they're quite complex because you have to suspend sand in it while you're doing it, and then it has to become runny to actually get into these fractures. And Richard's already showed something like this, but I just want to make the analogy with the sort of pictures I showed you for coal mining. A, a constrained band of seismicity, rather deeper than our coal mine, it's 7,000 feet, okay, more than 100,000 fracks were already done in the US, and felt seismicity is very, very rare. Very rare indeed. There have been some events reported from Oklahoma, but the chances are that that's not the fracking. Injection. <laughs> So they're intersection with faults. Hydrofracking in the UK is not new. Okay. It's been carried out for geothermal energy in Cornwall and will be carried out elsewhere. It was being carried out for coal bed methane in quite a few places. And was micro sized misty from it was monitored long ago by 1988. Kess Heffer, who's sitting here, one of my PhD students worked on the Beckingham Bowl where BP were carrying out hydrofracking. So I suspect that's the first micro-seismic <coughs> monitoring, much before 10 years, I'm afraid, Richard. Okay, so it's not as new as you think. And of course, we do not go to Priest Hall. A quadrilla drilled the first borehole and carried out some fracks. Now, this is very interesting. Okay, so first of all, you have small um, injections. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're not as good, are they? <laughs> Sorry, Eric. And a job is an injection of a large issue volume of a half a million. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Only, only in the boys store, David. <laughs> okay. So we had two frack jobs, two 
of these small mini fracs, which are a fracture is a very good way to actually understand the stress which is present at rock. In fact, fracturing and microseismicity are they probably the only two ways to understand what's happening deep in rock. You can't go down there. Okay? So if you disturb the stress a little bit and create a fracture, it has a dimension and an orientation which is dependent on the stress field, which you can then monitor using microseismicity. So the combination of those two things is the way of understanding rock behaviour. Unfortunately, on the 1st of April, I thought it was an April Fool's joke, but we, actually, we at Kiel actually detected a seis seismic event on our station in Kiel, okay, which is a little way from uh, Quadrillus, a magnitude 2.3, okay, which caused some consternation. Also, ovalization is called of the casing a couple of days afterwards. Then there was another hydrofrac, a smaller one, which actually didn't create any significant seismicity. And then another one and a half after this injection. So in actual fact, at that stage, Deck and various others said, we had better understand this a wee bit better. We and the BGS put seismic detectors on the surface above the peace hole well and monitored earthquakes and found quite a few, about 50. I've actually found five more, you guys, as it happens, by looking at the S. Delmuir uh, array, which looks for nuclear weapons tests. But very nice earthquakes. That's a horizontal component, a side-to-side -side movement. You've all got this on iPhone, so don't tell me you don't know what I'm talking about. That's a side-to-side -side movement, probably north-south, and that's a vertical motion, okay? A separate event. The vertical motions come in first, okay? And there is no vertical motion on those two seismometers. East-west seismometers don't detect any horizontal motion. That means that the seismic wave is coming directly up like that, more or less in a complete vertical sense, okay? That's, you only, as soon as I saw these, and it was from directly beneath that spot. Okay? Second one here, the same. Right? These are the P waves, vertical components. These are the S waves, actually, probably about there. Beautiful little seismic events, clearly showing that they are coming from very, very close to the wellhead. And of course, it quickly became clear that that was the case. There's some of the stations, there's the actual biggish event. There's the wellhead, okay? Now I'm going to talk about these details a bit more, but the size of the earthquake, the 2.3, makes us understand that this is not a tiny little tensile failure. This is a largish failure surface moving, probably a pre-existing one, okay? That's not really the issue. It failed repeatedly in a series of small earthquakes. The exact fault is yet to be identified, and I'll come to this later, but... This is the correlation of events with the particular fracking stages. Nothing here, a lot here, including a biggish one, nothing there, a lot there, and some following, okay? Now we can again plot the log of the number against the magnitude. And that gives us some idea of where the maximum is likely to lie, although there's not really enough. But somewhere, it's somewhere over here, somewhere to the east of two. And in actual fact, the seismic waveforms, that's five seismic waveforms placed right on top of each other, right? They're identical, right? Even, I've got to be up close here to see, okay, they've been scaled to be the same height, okay? They come from exactly the same place, what that, that's what that's saying, okay? Because the, the signature of a seismic event depends on the source and also the pathway it takes. If, there is, if they're as identical as that, they come from the same place. So there's a kind of set of rules for you apply to say whether something is natural or induced. All right? Get made up by these guys in the States, Davis and Froelich. Are these events the first known earthquakes of this character in the region? Yes. Is there a clear injection, a correlation between injection and seismicity? Yes. Are representatives near wells? Yes. Do earthquakes occur at or near injection depths? Yes. Are the changes in fluid pressures sufficient to encourage seismicity? We'll talk about that later. Probably. Now 
in actual fact, shale gas has very rarely produced felt seismic events. So it took everybody by surprise. Other things produce felt seismic events. Geothermal <laughs> fracking right, produces it. This is, this is a geothermal cloud where you're trying to generate um, connectivity in a hot granite to extract hot water. They're well documented as large as three and a half and possibly bigger. Okay. But it's very rare in, hydro, in shale hydrofracking. Typically less than one, as we'll see. There are differences, though, in the states. The Barnard Shale, the Marcellus Shale, they're relatively flat lying. Okay. The Bolin Shale isn't. It's quite steeply deeping. It's in a narrow basin that's been folded. So the tectonics is, is different. And many shale plays are in remote places with no monitoring. Right. If there, aren't, if there isn't anybody listening, do you know whether anything's happening? That's also true. There may be an issue for other disposal of water here. Okay? If you take the water and you in, insist on injecting it deep into the ground at depths greater than the core measures, okay, the presence of fluids right, facilitates movement on fractures. Okay? So if you insist on doing that, you can bring about bigger events. But they're not the hydrofracking events. So what should we do about this? Well, okay, we don't want people to feel earthquakes, but I have to tell you something. I'm at Kiel. Kiel starts at the edge of the potteries. Since Christmas, we've had a magnitude two and a half and a magnitude one point seven. Okay. Do you know how many people even bother to report the two and a half to BGS? Three. Okay. They're a bit more stoical in Stoke. <laughs> okay. Because they're used to it. Okay. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody has to get used to seismicity, but it does mean you have to take a tiny bit of perspective on these things. Okay. So, two and a half. But this is another way of looking at it. What is the peak particle velocity at the surface? Now, this comes from quarry blasting and drilling and other activities at the surface. Um, we, we have regulations. That's the British standard, BS7385 or 5885. Okay. It depends whether or not you're in a weak building or a strong building. These are reinforced buildings. Are allowed to have 50 um, millimeters per second peak particle velocity. Uh, old buildings, yeah. heritage buildings, it depends on the frequency. The Germans do it slightly different. In actual fact, theirs are more conservative than ours, but 50 millimeters per second is still appear. This is an interesting plot. There's um, a large report on issues to do with unconventional gas, including shale gas uh, <coughs> injection, has just come out from the National Academy of Sciences last Friday. Okay, so this is hottish from the press. Uh, you can find it on the US National Academy of Sciences website. What they have done is simulated a tectonic earthquake of magnitude 2. Point, well, no, of several magnitudes at a depth of about 9 to 10 kilometers and an, an, an earthquake induced by a well. Okay? And these are plots of, of how you will feel them. Okay? So this is, these are a magnitude 3 earthquake. You need to be somewhere between a 4 and a 5, probably about a 4 and a, a half to feel it at the surface. But in actual fact, if you actually, this is only at about 2 kilometers deep, so rather shallower than the, the uh, injection we've seen. Right, you only just detect a magnitude three. Now, I take a bit of issue with it because, in actual fact, I've seen people who get sensitized to this detect a one and a half, a one. If you've never heard, what, if you've never felt one before, you won't feel it. If you've felt several before, you start to get your eye and the ear in to it. So, uh, in actual fact, I think this is rather an underestimate. In Nottinghamshire, we are getting people reporting things at about one and a half. Okay. Because the magnitude of the induced events is actually quite important because it tells us the maximum level of, of vibration acceleration. So these happen in younger rocks, generally in sandstones of carbon fusage associated with coal mining. Okay. Hydrofracture occurs in even weaker rocks than those coal measure sandstones and actually at deeper depths. Inducing an event of that size, right, 
requires you to increase the pore pressure that have above levels that have been pre-existing. And over a region big enough to stimulate a fault to produce that size of earthquake. A magnitude 3 at a depth of 2 to 3 kilometres is from a rupture area of 0 0.060 square kilometres. 15 acres, I'm not quite sure where I found that. That's the actual area. But the movement is only a couple of centimetres. Now, it depends on a few things. I had to take a slide out here because I said I had too many. There's a very interesting one about uh, the magnitude of displacement against fault length, but let's not talk about that. That may be felt. May in rare circumstances cause superficial damage. Will not cause structural damage. We've seen hundreds and hundreds of mine-induced events. Subsidence causes damage. Mine-induced events, no. But the possibility of other earthquakes happening cannot be ruled out. And this is where we do take exception. By the way, I, I wrote, this is, this is taken mostly from the report I've just written. You can't say that there aren't other faults there. The faults and their movement can be very, very small. Okay? So ruling out other earthquakes. What I am saying, though, that is they will, because of their strength, they will not exceed about three, the strength of the rocks, and they're very unlikely to get to that because okay. so we're fairly clear as our core driller that the observed seismicity was induced by the hydraulic tre factor treatments. They're too close, they're too repeatable. And there's two possible ways that could have happened. Either the borehole actually intersected a fault and when they hydrofractured they pumped water at the fault. The presence of water in faults or any kind of rock discontinuity will reduce the normal shear stress and make it more likely to fail, okay? But you can't, that's not been seen in the borehole. It's possible that the fault is a few hundred metres away, but in shales, as I'll show you, we have discontinuities or weaknesses in a laminar sense, as Mike showed you, along the planes of these shales. It's much more likely that fluid is actually propagated along these bedding planes and have eventually intersected a fault. That's Colorado oil shales, right? These are samples from the boreholes at 8,000 feet, and they have these polished surfaces called slick insides, which indicate that some movement <coughs> is possible. And when you look at these rocks in coal, they actually are disc, they do, they do have discontinuities. And to some extent, so this is maybe what you are talking about, you start wedging open these discontinuities, okay, which are not very linear. They're actually irregular. They're crinkly. Okay? So you, they move in jogs. So you force them apart and they, uh, they actually move like a ratchet. Okay? If you can actually then support those with propens, you can get fluid through them. But these are, poss these are, these are possible ways that you can actually propagate fluid. <coughs> what I'm saying here is that the propent goes a certain distance, the fluid will go further. Okay? And it will particularly go further if you hold it at high pressure for long periods of time. Okay? Or consideration. So it seems much more likely to me, and I think you know, there's a few others, possibly two, that it hasn't intersected the fault. The fault is somewhere else, but it's, the fluid has actually made its way into that fault zone. Now, there's only a limited amount of data, right? We came in after the fact with monitoring. We weren't monitoring beforehand. We monitored afterwards. But we've learned quite a bit. We've got 50 nice little earthquakes. We don't think that you can rule out further earthquakes. I don't think that is possible to, to rule out further earthquakes. What we probably can do is understand their maximum magnitude and their maximum vibration and their maximum vo velocity. That's what we can do. And the people of Stoke wouldn't even get out of bed to phone about these you know, guys. But we do conclude that an effective mitigation strategy is an essential part of moving forward in this. If we stop now, we will know no more than we know now. Right? We'll never know whether the shale gas, we'll never know whether it causes significant seismicity, but it needs to be done very carefully. We need to monitor microseismicity very carefully and use it as a tool, which is what they do in Chermo. 
It is the Earth talking to us. Earthquakes are my friends, right? right. Only way to get a decent conversation. Right? They're telling you about what's happening in the rock. They're one of the only ways. Okay? So we need to monitor them. We need to monitor them before, during, and after these activities. Now, when does it become tricky? Well, in actual fact, if you look in the rest of the world, or most of the rest of the world, or at least as far as the rest of the world goes for shale gas fracking the States, this is a guy called Norm Wapinski, who is one of the real gurus in this. This is um, depth, right, from the surface, from 3,000 anyway to 9,000. And this is the magnitude of events that they've detected. Thousands and thousands here. At shallow depth, okay, they're usually less than minus two. Right? So when we've had plus two. These are <coughs> minus two. Every going down, every one unit is a decrease of 30 in energy. Okay, so you go down two from two to zero is about a thousand. From zero to minus two is another thousand. The difference between a two and a minus two is a net is nearly a million in terms of energy. Okay, just to give you a bit of perspective. But when you get deeper, the rocks get stronger, and you can get bigger events. And we decided that about 0.5 on the basis of all of these other events, was where we should start to say, if this happens, right, call, call the police, or whatever. And so, Quadrilla suggested a traffic light system with a rather higher threshold. We have suggested to DEC that what we want is effectively, this is green. If it's less than zero, carry on, okay? You have something called flowback when you release the pressure and you draw the water back off. We don't think you should hold that water for a long time in there. But you can carry on, okay, if it's less than zero. If it's been naught and a half, and there's more than one event, okay, pull water out for 36 hours, have one of these mini fracks, and then cautiously go ahead without increasing the volume of water. If you have an event greater or at node point five, okay, which is derived from the previous picture, shut down immediately, okay? And then depending how that seismicity then changes, because that might be the precursor to something else. It's li still less than one and a half, wait three days, okay, proceed carefully. If it's greater than one and a half, pull water out for 10 days, right? And then reconsider. So this is quite, con this is quite conservative. Um, any Swiss people here? Right? The Swiss have a level of 2.3. It's rarely that we're much more conservative than the Swiss. In seismicity, I'll just add that. Just. So this, the Swiss with their geothermal will allow the threshold to proceed to 2.3 before they stop activity. Now, if we've been criticized for anything in this report, we've been criticized for being too conservative and many people say we should have let it go to one or something. But at 0.5, things will stop. Now, the more water you put in, the more earthquakes you get. There's also a bit of argument about that, but it seems at least intuitively true. The less you put in, probably, the more, less earthquakes. Okay? So we suggest that the, re the injected fluid volume is kept as low as possible. And that is not held in there, okay? Because as I've said, propent will stop flowing, but water may percolate. So, we, so no, no, no pressurising of the of the reservoir. It, it. And what's really important, I think, is to know your enemy, okay? To understand what the seismic background is before you start, okay? So we need to know potential seismic hazards by background seismic monitoring, okay? Now, actually, in fact, the Boland area is actually quite benign as far as seismicity, so it might not have given us very, very much of a clue, to be honest, okay? But we need to do it. And you need to know where the faults are as best you can, right? Now, that's not as easy as it sounds, right? But you can, you can make steps. It clearly is important to know where they are by all available, I guess, economic will come into it. If it's too, if it's too pricey, then the shale gas won't be done. And then we also need to look at models of how particular events will produce ground motions at the surface. Okay? Because 
People have said to us, well, why don't you use peak particle velocity? But peak particle velocity at the surface depends on local geological conditions. And what uh, particular uh, level of, of vibration in one place may not be in the next place. That's why we're using the magnitude of the events, which is to do with the, the earthquake source. But we do need to have reasonable models of the surface geology and its engineering response so you can see whether there's any hot spots where you can get seismic amplification. So that's another important thing. And of course, all of Europe is to some extent waiting to see what we do, at least the French are probably, right? Because all of these countries, as Mike and Richard have already shown you, have all got shale gas potential. Okay? And now we have recognised the new seismicity. It's very difficult for us to say that it can't be caused. But I do think that with appropriate monitoring, okay, carried out in carried out carefully, we should move forward. Otherwise, we will never be any wiser than we are now. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. We have time for some questions. No sharp objects, though, right? <laughs> Question over here, please. please Mr. Wait for, the, wait for the microphone, please. Mr. How are you? <laughs> There we go. Yes, Jim Pontin. Um, first, Prof, I'd like to take issue with the fact that you made great play of the limited strength of shale. My reading of the Quadrilla Commission reports, mm -hmm. the consensus view was that the fault reactivation occurred within the Clitheroe limestone and possibly the Pendleside limestone. But the, it didn't just move in the clear of limestone. No, indeed. The injection intervals for stage one mm -hmm. and stage two, which produced the largest tremor, mm -hmm. in the, that was located in the Worston Shell, mm -hmm. which is between the Pendleside limestone and the Clithero limestone, which is a pretty thick limestone just below the depth of fracturing. So. We probably I, can't be as specific as that. I'm, I'm not sure the actual... Well, I, I said the consensus yes, yes. view of yeah. Quadrilla's mm. commission reports. Yeah. Yeah. That's one point. Mm. The other point is that you have, I think, failed to emphasise that the micro-seismic monitoring has to be combined with fluid pressure monitoring in the surrounding area. That is how the USGS have maintained for many, many years that there is a practical engineering protocol for controlling seismicity, the combination of measuring micro-seismicity and fluid pressure. I'm not against monitoring pressure, actually. But you In haven't fact, mentioned it. I'm talking about seismicity. They're there's related. A man, there's a man here going to talk about hydrogeology and hydrology, if you don't mind. We're talking about mechanics. Listen, I've, I've actually monitored both pressure and seismicity in boreholes in Northwich, monitoring the fault mines. It's quite possible to put piezometers into, into the same boreholes as seismometers. It's actually not a problem. However, compartmentalization of, of aquifers doesn't necessarily mean that you will actually achieve monitoring of the appropriate pressure. Uh, you know, the paper I think you referred to by Richard Warden, in actual fact, was not about... Uh, was not about uh, shales. It was actually about the Sherwood sandstone, a much more permeable material which with much higher uh, permeability. You've misunderstood me. I, no, I'm, I I'm advocating you. monitoring fluid pressure within the injection intervals well, that's in the problem. shales themselves. Yes, that's fine. If you can get, remember these are very, these are micro Darcy or nano Darcy permeabilities. Uh, you, you may have a very long time response before you actually get uh, a hydrogeological change over those distances. I'm out of my depth, Bob Wood. You can come and talk about hydrogeology. Any more general questions before we get too bogged down in that area of discussion? Yes, please. Thank you. Just a quickie. Yeah. Um, Christopher Carnegie again, I'm afraid, uh, right. member of the public. Fine. Um, you, you mentioned the recently published NAS report. Yeah. If it's the same one of which I have a, a four-page executive summary in my hand, it mentions uh, another 
application, which is carbon capture and storage. Yes. yes. And it considers yes. that yes. potentially there is yes. greater risk there because one is injecting and what is not withdrawing, yes. and one is injecting at high pressure. Do you have any observation on that? Um, I have suggested microseismic monitoring is, it is one of the prime tools to monitor carbon capture and storage. Not the only one. We've actually done gravity over gas storage uh, in Yorkshire, we can actually see gravity changes because of the change of mass which goes in and out. But microseismicity is one of the ways of detecting structural structural changes. Absolutely, yes. And this is this is already done in gas storage reservoirs. Okay, I'm not talking about sequestration. I'm talking about storage in salt, uh, of which there is a great deal everywhere apart from in the UK. Um, microseismicity is part of that. It is one of the fluid pressures are, could be important. Yes, I'm not. But microseismicity is instantaneous. Right? It's telling you about the fracture it happens within milliseconds of it happening. And that is the importance of it, that you have a continuing, more or less real-time picture of what's going on. I think we'll have to call that to a close. Thank you, Peter. I've run out of rubber bands. So <laughs> yeah, they've talking. all gone now. We'll have to restart the station recovers. I'd like to call upon Rob Ward now to address the issues associated with groundwater, well integrity.